Hey, Hello. come on in. All right. How are y'all doing? You ready? We are continuing related rates. And let's see how we're doing on the calendar here. Yeah, we're right on track, good. <clears throat> All right, so we uh, started this problem last class. We didn't finish it. We had the plane that was flying overhead <clears throat> and 600 miles an hour, two miles high, radar station tracking the um, plane. And in this question, we were asked, at the instant that the plane is exactly six miles from the radar station, how fast the angle is changing. So how fast is this rotating? As opposed to the one we did before, it was a little different. It was asking how fast is the distance between them changing. So we went through the whole setup. <clears throat> we labeled everything. We figured out we were, we were given dA dt. We wanted d theta dt. We came up with an equation off of our general picture that related theta and a together. We used tangent for that. And then I multiply both sides by a. That way I could take the derivative. And to take the derivative, we did implicit differentiation. But we had to do the product rule right here. And this is where we stopped. All right? So we are at the point now where we are ready to go try and solve for d theta dt. So we want to make sure that we have everything that we need for this. So do we know dA dt? Yes, we, it's given to us, right? So we know that. Do we know what theta is? Not directly, right? I mean, we don't directly have any information about theta. We do know that once we've taken the derivative, we can look at this picture. So when you look at this picture, can you solve for theta? Yes. You can, because you have two sides of a triangle and you have the angle. So we can solve for theta. Um, and then we need secant of theta, and then we need to square that. So we're going to need to get theta, right? So this right here, we don't know right away. That right there, we don't know right away. Do we know d theta dt? Yeah, we do. Well, we don't know it, but that's what we're looking for, right? So we're happy to see that. And then do we know what A is at the moment in question? We don't. Um, again, A is this side right here, right? But A is one side of a right triangle, so we have the other two sides. We should be able to solve for A. So even though we don't have it directly, we will be able to get it, right? So we have... Uh, couple of things we can do here. Um, let's get A first. How about that? Okay, let's get A. So I'm going to come back over here. I'm going to erase this. I don't need it. I know that A squared plus 2 squared equals 6 squared by the Pythagorean identity. So I know that A squared <coughs> plus 4 equals 36. So A is equal to root 32. Subtract 4, take the square root. All right, so I'm going to come back over here. I'm going to replace this with root 32. Now, here's my question to you. Do I actually need to find theta? Do I need to actually know what that angle theta is right now in order to finish this problem out? No, why not? 50-50? It's either yes or no? Do I need the angle theta? Well, I need to figure out what tangent of theta is, don't I? Yes. But I have the triangle. Tangent, by definition, is opposite over adjacent, right? So tangent of theta is 2 over root 32, right? I don't need to go figure out that, that theta is like 37 degrees. I don't need to know that. I just need to know what the tangent of it is. And I can get it by, by just looking at the triangle. Do you see that? Now, let's just say you had to get theta, all right? Let's say you had to. We don't need to, but let's say you had to. What I would do if I were doing this, if I had to find theta, I would do, let's see, this is opposite and hypotenuse, right? I would just do sine, sine theta. 
is 2 over 6, right? So sine theta is 1 third. And then I get on my calculator. Well, first I do arc sine on both sides. I take arc sine over here and arc sine over here. Let me do it like this. And this side becomes theta, and this side is arc sine of 1 third. So I get on my calculator. I do arc sine of 1 third. It would give me an answer. And that answer would either be in degrees or in radians, depending on the mode that my calculator was in. And then, whatever it gives me, I could then plug that in. I'd do tangent of that angle, and that would give me the answer. But it's more work than I need to do. Do you all see that? OK, let's start plugging things in. DADT, -D I've erased it, right? It was negative 600 times tangent theta. What's tangent theta? 2 over root 32. You understand where I'm getting that? OK. Plus, now, secant theta squared. So first, what's secant theta? It's cosine flipped over, right? Cosine is what over what? Adjacent over hypotenuse, right? So secant is hypotenuse over adjacent. So 6 over um, root 32 is secant theta. But what do I have to do to it? Square it. So that's secant squared theta right there. And then d theta dt is what I'm trying to solve for. And then what's a? a is root 32. And then equals 0. And these are all just numbers, right? I mean, you can, you can figure it out on your calculator if you wanted to, or we could get an exact answer. Let's do the exact answer. That means let's try and do this without using a calculator. So let's see. This, these two multiply together. I get negative 1,200 over root 32. And then what about all this stuff? <clears throat> if I square the top, square the bottom, 6 over 32. I'm uh, sorry, 36 over 32. But then times the root 32. So plus. 36 over 32 You could reduce it, yeah. I'll, I'll do all reducing, I guess, in a second. Uh, 32 on the bottom, uh, 32, just 32, not root 32. And then d theta dt, and then equals 0. Okay, so that's 36 over uh, 32, but then I have to multiply by root 32, put that all in front of d theta dt. And now to solve this, I'm going to move this to this side. So I'm going to have 36. Uh, root 32 over 32 equals positive 1,200 over root 32. And then what do you do? <clears throat> what do you do? How do you do? Oh, I, what am I forgetting? Oops. d theta dt, right? Equals 1,200 over root 32. So if I want to get d theta dt by itself, I'll multiply both sides by the reciprocal on the left side. So I'm going to multiply this side by 32 over 36 root 32, and then multiply this side by 32 over 36 root 32. Do you all see that? Yep. On the left side, what do I get on the left? <clears throat> Just d theta dt? equals. Now over here, I think I get some good things to happen here. When you put these two thir root 32's together, you get 32. And then it cancels with that 32. And then you get 1,200 over 36. What goes into both of those? 12? 12 goes into this 100 times. And then 12 goes into this 3 times. <coughs> So 100 thirds is our answer. 100 third what? 100 thirds what? So think about, remember how I said to look at the answer. You look at these two unit, these two things right here. So let's do the bottom one first, time, because that's the easier one. Time, how are things measured here? Hours, hours right? So this is going to be per hour, but it's what per hour? 
the, the, the angle, right? Now, how are we measuring the angle? Because there's radians and degrees, right? Your answer in problems like this will always be in radians. So this is going to be radians per hour. Now, could you convert radians to degrees? How do you convert radians to degrees? You take, you take the 100 over 3 and you multiply by what? 180 degrees over pi. That's how you, how you do that. Can somebody do that on their calculator real quick? What is it? Oh, yeah, this, that, that, that's, okay, we can do it that way. So six, 60 there, but then 600 over pi. I need that. We're going to get approximate decimal answer. 600 divided by 3.1415. Oops. 415. I'm getting approximately 190.99 degrees per hour. Pretty sure I got that. So this, is, this answer is acceptable. But just for us to get some better idea, because radians don't really make a lot of sense to us, degrees do. This is saying that if a plane is two miles high, going 600 miles per hour, then at the exact moment, that the exact moment that the plane is six miles from the radar station, this radar station is, is turning, is rotating at that rate. So we know that as the plane goes over, it's going to speed up. And as it goes past, it's going to slow down. The, the, the turning motion is going to slow down. But at that exact instant, that's the instantaneous rate of change of the radar, which is almost 180 degrees is what? Like, like that? It's almost that much in an hour. So it's pretty slow, isn't it? It's a pretty slow rotation. 190 degrees an hour. It's pretty slow. Questions? Well, we're going to do more. Yes, we're doing more. So if, if the, uh, what's important, I guess, for you to, to make sure you understand is that this is the instantaneous rate of change, right? At that particular instant. Later on, at a different instant in time, it's going to be a different rate of change. This rate of change is only valid for that instant. Are you getting something different? No? What do you get? You got 119? We also got 1,909. Wait a minute, six? Oh, 1,000, hold on. I put 600 over pi, oops. Yeah, so that should be, yeah, that's, oops. Yeah, I need to move my decimal over one. Sorry about that. I don't know why I put 600 instead of 6,000 over pi. Well, that, there you go, that's rotating a little faster, isn't it? That's 10 times as fast. All right. I'm glad you all had that look on your faces. All right, next problem. Can you all read that? A street light is mounted on top of a 20-foot pole. A six-foot man walks away from the pole at a speed of seven <laughs> feet per second. Is that pretty fast? Maybe he's very consciously walking away from the pole. How fast is his shadow moving along the ground relative to the pole? exactly at the moment he's 12 feet from the pole. So you always take the first few seconds, minutes to kind of absorb it and maybe start with a picture. So I'll have the general picture here. I'll have the instant in time right here. 
So in general, I'll start with the light pole. There's my light. You can tell it's a light, that's obvious. It's 20 feet tall, right? And that doesn't change in the problem. And here's the ground. So this is 20 feet. That's gonna be the same in the, the instant picture, isn't it? Has anyone been by that McDonald's right here off of 151 near SeaWorld lately? They remodeled it or like tore it down and started over and rebuilt a new one. Have you ever been there at night? They have lights that they've put up around the parking lot and it's like, it's like they're trying to, I don't know, it's, it's overwhelming. I almost said something to them because it's, they're LEDs and they shine down, so at least they're not like super light polluting, but it's just like you drive by, you're like, whoa, it's like lit up. Exactly, exactly. I don't know, I'm thinking, I'm thinking that this is a, I should have LED lights that just shine down and not up. Just do that, you know, light pollution. All right, what next? I'll draw. You, you tell me what to draw. I'll draw it. A man, six feet tall, right? Okay, so in the general picture, he's here. He's walking away from the pole, so he's somewhere, right? Oh, yeah, no, no, I wasn't done, man. I wasn't done. But see, I didn't want you to in interpret that as him running. See, but I would have done a bent knee. I don't know. I'd... Okay, so we've got the man, right? He's six feet tall. That's not changing. That's not changing. So I'm going to just label that fact that he is six feet tall. You know what? I think I'll do it on the other side. He's six foot tall. Okay, and that doesn't change over here, right? He's still six foot tall over here. And, okay, what else? His shadow. His shadow. You need to draw his shadow. So where is his shadow? It's on the ground, right? It's going to be on the right side of him. So the way you look at it is if this light is shining, right, his body is creating a shadow on the ground, so the tip of the shadow should run right as his head right there should be like out here somewhere, right? So his shadow on the ground something like that. That's his shadow on the ground. I've already told you it's impressive and not to, not to be intimidated. <laughs> Whoa, this shadow looks a little different. Okay, I'm going to stretch him out. There we go. There's his shadow on the ground over here. You get the idea, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Anything else I can throw on here? How about on that instant picture? Is there something I know about the instant in time we're talking about? He is 12 feet from the pole, right? He is, not his shadow. He is 12 feet from the pole. So that means the distance from here to here is 12 here. Now over in that picture, that's changing, isn't it? So why don't I label it over there as X? And that would be the distance from the pole to him. Call it X. Does that make sense? If I'm going to label it something here, then I'm going to give it a variable over here. What else? I haven't used something there, the speed, right? The speed which what he moves, right? The speed at which he is moving. So those little dash marks behind him. That's seven feet per second. What is that? In terms of our pictures, what is this? Seven feet per second. It's a speed, right? A velocity, it's, it's a derivative, right? It's the rate of change of something. Now does our picture 
Can we get in our picture and see what it is that's changing? X. At X. X is changing at seven feet per second, right? The distance from the man to the pole, as this moves as a point, right? As he moves, like a point is moving and it's stretching X out. So X is changing at that rate of seven feet per second. So that's a given, isn't it? That's given to me. That DX DT is seven feet per second. All right, what do I want? So go to the question in the problem. How fast, right? So it wants a derivative. How fast is his shadow moving along the ground relative to the pole? DS over DT equals 12 feet. What's that? D? D, so S, you want to use S for shadow? Okay, now where is it on my picture? Where is S on my picture? I mean, we have to put it here somewhere, right? Where? Right here? When we talk about his shadow, I think we have to understand or agree that we mean the tip of his shadow. All right? So the tip of his shadow right here would be the distance from here all the way back to the pole, because it says relative to the pole, right? all the way back to the pole, that is S. Understand? We're going to call that S for shadow. And so we want what? DS we want DS DT. We want to know how fast S is moving. We know he's moving seven feet per second, right? But the tip of his shadow is moving also. What do y'all think? He's moving at a constant rate. Do you think his shadow is speeding up? Like as he walks away from the pole, do you think the tip of his shadow is moving faster and faster away from the pole than he is? Or do you think it's moving at the, a constant rate? Or do you think it's slowing down? What do y'all think? Who, how many of you think that as he walks at his constant seven feet per second, that the tip of his shadow starts to speed up and speed up and speed up. How many of y'all think that? Okay. How many of you think that as he moves at seven feet per second, the tip of his shadow is moving, but it's moving also at a constant rate? Okay. Do you think it's seven feet per second or something different? You think it's different? Okay. Anyone think that the shadow is slowing down? No? Okay. All right, good. We'll see. We're about to see what happens, all right? But I think this is a good idea. This is a good example. Again, show, show your hands if you th think that this, the shadow is speeding up. Show you. Come on. It's all right. One, okay. It's kind of stretching, right? It, it is. It is. As he moves away, his shadow gets longer, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Right? Because think about, think about him way out here. When he's way out here, his shadow is like, right that, right? How bright is the light though? Yeah, you're right. Let's just say there's no other light anywhere. We're on a flat planet. And this light source does not lose any of its luminosity over distance, all right? So if he's moving at a constant rate, is the tip of his shadow speeding up? Yes? OK. OK, so in the beginning, here's his shadow, right? Let's just say what, when he I might be able to do this. So hell, hold on. I don't know if this will work. I don't think so. Yeah, let me see. Yeah, it's not working. Let me see. That's not working because I need the ground. That's the. Pro I, I don't think I can do it. Yeah, I can turn off the lights, but.
What I'm saying is that in the beginning, his shadow, like in the beginning, let's say he's over here, right? His shadow is really short on the ground. Agree? Now, as he starts moving, as he starts moving, he is moving at a constant rate, but his shadow is starting to stretch out, isn't it? So if you, just, if you just were to be tracking the tip of the shadow, just looking at the tip of the shadow, as he moves, is the tip of the shadow, like just, is it moving at a constant rate? No. Or is the tip of his shadow speeding up as, as he walks at a constant rate? Does that make more sense? Okay, so how many of you think his shadow is speeding up? Wow, whoa, I changed all your minds now, okay. How many of you think that his shadow is still moving at a constant rate? Okay. All right. You're all wrong. <laughs> this, but this is, the, this is why we have mathematics. Your intuition, your intuition can be wrong. I agree with your intuition. It seems like the tip of his shadow should be speeding up. But the mathematics is going to tell us something different. And the math is not going to be wrong. Okay? We're going to be wrong. All right, so let's, and you can sit here and argue with me all day long. You can sit here and say, but it's, it. there's nothing to argue about. The math is going to tell us, all right? So this is an example, I think, of a problem that is what we call counterintuitive. It goes completely against your intuition, but you have to trust the math, all right? All right, um, we want ds, dt. When do we want this? When what's 12 feet? Which we've called what? S. What's the 12 here? The distance from the man to the pole, which is x. It's always important. When we set up our given, it's always a derivative. What we want is always a derivative. And this statement right here, we've had in every single problem we've done, is always when, and you must state the variable when h is 5, or when theta is this, or when whatever, you can't just put when 12, because you've got to be able to um, go back to it in the picture somewhere and replace that variable with it, all right? Okay, we got it all? All right, I think that's it. Equation time. Equation time. I need an equation that relates what two variables together? X and S. X and S. Anything you can think of that relates X and S together. Whew. So I think here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to erase this. And I'm going to draw my general a picture again. I'm going to draw it for you. But this time when I draw it, I'm not going to put all that beautiful, ah, I'm not going to put all that beautiful detail I had in there before. This is just going to be a basic, basic picture. And if I draw it as a basic picture, you might have a better time with it. Right? That's my picture without all that foo-foo stuff on it, right? The man is six feet. The pole is 20 feet. The distance from the man to the pole is x. The distance from the tip of the shadow to the pole is s. What, are we, what have we got here? I'm going to erase this one now. See if I can help you. Ah, good. I drew two different triangles there. They're both right triangles. Right? The first triangle I drew is the big one. And the second triangle I drew is the small one. This is six. This right here is that distance take away that distance. So that's s minus x. Do you all agree? These two triangles are what we refer to as similar triangles, meaning they both have the exact same angles. 
They both have this as a right angle, right? This angle is the angle for the big triangle, and it's the angle for the small triangle. So if that angle's the same, and these are both right tri uh, 90 degrees, then these angles have to be the same. And whenever you have triangles that have all the angles are the same, you have similar triangles. And what does that mean? Because it means something important. These triangles are similar. Anyone know what that means? Two triangles are similar. It means the ratio of corresponding sides are, are equal or congruent. Basically, if you take the ratio of any two sides, it will be equivalent to the ratio of any other two sides. So one way I can say it is this. 20 divided by s is equivalent to 6 divided by s minus x. Or I could say s divided by 20 is equal to s minus x divided by 6. Or I could say 20 over 6 is equal to s over s minus x. Any ratio of corresponding sides is congruent, is equal. Understand? But that equality, you said you weren't going to be here. I know. Uh, uh, no. <laughs> Can't change your mind. So the way you set it up, we get an equality. Okay? That's where we get the equation from. So let's try and set it up. How about I do the first one I started with? 20 over s is equal to 6 over s minus x. Yeah? I don't like that, actually. I don't like my s's and x's in the denominator. Do you? 20 over s, do you feel like messing with that? I'd rather have s over 20. Is that, is that OK with you? I'm going to do it that way. s over 20 must be equivalent to s minus x over 6. And that is an equation, right? That equation has both x and s in it, and that's all I needed, was any equation based on my picture that gives me a relationship between the two. As soon as I have an equation, I can differentiate it. Any questions? I'm just going to come back. Or I'm, I'm now going to start messing with this. I'm not ready to differentiate. Um, I'm going to clean things up a little bit before I differentiate. Uh, what is a common denominator? Do we have one? Eh. 120, right? I'm trying to clear the fractions. If I multiply both sides by 120, you could actually go lower and mm. 60? Yeah. We'll do 60. 60 here, 60 here. Okay, what do I get over there? So 3s. Right? 60 divided by 20 is 3. Y'all okay? I told you you're going to be wrong, but you, you, can, you can still participate, yes? 60 divided by 6 is 10. That 10 will go to both of those. Be real careful there. That 10 that comes when you cancel these will distribute through to both, right? See, isn't that equation a little nicer? So let's move all of our s's to one side and all of our x's to the other. Just because it'll, it'll just, I want to put my s's together because they're cancel, right? Some of them will go away. So I'm going to subtract 3s here, make that 7s. And then I'm going to take this to the other side and make it 10x. Now isn't that a nice little equation here? Isn't that nice? So this is our equation right there, simplified out. And now I get to differentiate this with respect to time. So what is the derivative of the left side, Marissa? Marissa? Did I call on you last time? I did? Louise? Derek, did I call on you last time? I did. Oh, I'm looking at the wrong stack here. Karen? I call, uh-oh. I'm interested. Jace, did I call you last time? Yeah, probably. Okay, left side is 10, Frank. All right, I guess we're all back in the pot together. I don't know what happened to my sticks. The derivative of the left side, Jace, is what? With respect to t. Okay, 10 is a constant, right? Mm -hmm. Attached to this, it's going to come for the ride. So 10 is there. What's the derivative of x with, res uh, with respect to t? Remember me at the club, right? Me at the club asking what the derivative of x is? 
Yeah, with respect to what, right? That's the important thing. With respect to t, dx dt equals, now derivative of the right side, 7 times ds dt. Now we look at that, go back to what we are given and what we want. Right? Go back to what we were given and what we want. dx dt, wasn't that given to us? What, what, okay. It was 7, right? I've erased it, but it was 7. And ds dt is what we wanted. Right? So I'm, I'm ready to go. This is going to be 10 times 7 equals 7 times ds dt. And now you just divide both sides by 7. And you get what? 10 equals ds dt. And 10 is measured how? 10 what? S is the distance from here to here. And the distance we're measuring in feet. And time is in seconds. And remember I said you were all wrong, right? Why are you wrong? Because this is a constant, right? Look at this. The, the, rate, at which, the rate at which it's changing. Look at, look at, I think it's more important to look at it. Yeah, I mean, you can look at it right here. Notice, notice that the rate at which S is changing with respect to time has nothing to do with where he is. Do you see in this equation right here? I said, we, we know this, right? We want to know this. Nowhere in here did, did it, we need to know where he was actually positioned. Do you see that that 12, remember he is 12 feet? Do you see that that plays no part at all in our answer? Do you all see that? If it did, then somewhere in our answer, somewhere in this derivative, we would have had an x in there. And then his position would have contributed to the rate at which s is changing, but it makes no difference. So as this guy walks at 7 feet per second, his shadow is steadily just moving along at 10 feet per second. We're done. That was kind of strange, huh? So we needed to know similar triangles to do that problem. This is an animation of it. I think if you look at it this way, you can see that the shadow is just moving along. It's not, it's not speeding up or slowing down. Do you all see a shadow? Relative to the pole. The tip of that shadow is, is just moving along. Right? Constant rate. He is also moving along at a constant rate, right? But it's not as fast as the shadow. Stop running. There we go. Oh, yes, yes. This is a classic example. It's classic because I think this is one of the first problems that, that I did. Well, not one of the first ones, but this was a problem that I did when I was in Cal 1, and I was just like, like, really? Like, really, I have to do that much stuff for this? Really? Like, it was... I don't know. It's just burned into my brain, this problem right here. A conical cup is four inches tall and six inches wide. Okay? Water is being poured into the cup at a constant rate of two pi cubic inches per second. That's a volume. So you've got this conical cup. You know those little white water cups that they put on the side of igloo things and you go get a drink, right? You know what I'm talking about? Little paper cups. Imagine we have a cup like that. It's four inches tall, six inches wide, 
and we're pouring water into it at a constant rate. How fast is the water level rising when the water is one inch from the top of the cup? So let's look at the picture of this first. So I have set up my computer to animate this by pouring in a constant, it's, it's pouring in a volume at a constant rate right now, all right? And what you'll notice is, is what I think you probably expected, and that's in the beginning, the level rises fast, doesn't it? See how fast it's coming up? But it starts to slow down, doesn't it? It starts to slow down, slow down, slow down, slow down, slow down, because I'm pouring it at a constant rate. So the question, the question that we're, we're asking is at exactly the instant that the water level is one inch from the top, so like somewhere around right, I don't know, right about there, how fast is that water level coming up? Okay? So let's start with some pictures. I'm going to leave the units off. That's four inches and six inches, right? We agree with that picture? Yep. The picture in the instant is the same. What I have not included in this yet is the water. The water is inside the cup, right? So I need to include that. In the instant, it's supposed to be what? At the instant in time, one inch from the top, right? One inch from the top. So I would say at this instant in time, you know, your water level is somewhere like that, right? <clears throat> That's at the instant in time. But over here, it's not one inch from the top, right? Let's, let's put this. That's one inch from the top right there. But over here in general, it can be anywhere, can't it? Right? Anywhere? So let me just throw it in here arbitrarily. Here's my water level. And since that water level is a variable, I'm going to label the, the height of the water. I'm going to label it as H. Is that okay? For what? For hydrogen. hydrogen dioxide, yes. Well, in the general picture, we're not, we can't know what level the water is going to be since it's not an instant. That's right. On the general picture, we have to label it as H because it's changing, oh. right? It's moving. The, the cone itself is fixed, right. but the water level inside of it is changing. Over here, the distance has to be one from the top, right? All right. Let me start. Let me write down what I want, what I'm given, and what I want. Let's see. Maybe you can help me with that. Given, want. What am I given? A rate, right? Rate at which the, the what? What? Water is being poured into a cup at a constant rate. That means a derivative of 2 pi cubic inches per second. You said that was a measurement of volume, right? Yeah. So they, they're giving us the rate at which the volume is changing. N not the height, right? The volume. So they're giving us dv dt. That's what they're giving us. And it's 2 pi, I'll put cubic inches per second. Now volume is not in my picture, is it? I don't have like, nothing is labeled V because volume is actually a formula for the picture. Like the blue part in here has a volume, doesn't it? The blue part here has a volume, whatever it is. 
Now, what do we want? What do we want? So, how fast is the water level rising? How am I representing my water level? With H, right? H is my water level. So we want dH dt. And when is it that we want that? When what? When what's three? H is three. Right? Instead of saying one inch from the top, equivalently we could say three inches high. Right? Because the cup is four inches. Understand? H is the height, H is the height of the water level. That's all H is. It's how, how high the water is in our cup. I want to know how fast the, the height is changing at the instant that it's, the height is one inch from the top. I need an equation. I need an equation that relates the volume of the water to the height of the water. So you're looking in your formula sheets. The, the volume of a, of a cone is what? One third pi r squared h. So you can look that up. In your, in your formula sheets, it gives you a picture like this. The cone is upside down. They give you the radius here is r, and they give you that the height of the cone is h, and they tell you that the volume is 1 3rd pi r squared h. Now, am I happy to see this formula? Yes, yes but there's a problem. What's the problem? r. Right? r here. So when I take, if I were to take the derivative of this right now, Right? Right now, if I take the derivative, I'm gonna have to, I'd have to work it out, but what are the three differentials that would come out of this? When I say differentials, I mean the derivatives. What three different derivatives would come out? dv dt, dr dt, and dh dt. dv dt, I don't mind seeing. dh dt, I don't mind seeing. dr dt, I know nothing about. And so it will become a problem, won't it? I need to somehow see if there's a way to eliminate R from the formula. Can I somehow eliminate R so that it's no longer in the formula? So I'm going to go back to my general picture. You ready for this? Watch. Just, just watch me first. Ooh, not very good. That's terrible, actually. OK, so what I've done here is I have taken the cone, and I have cut it right down the center. And I've opened it up, and I'm looking at a cross section of it. And of course, the water didn't pour out. It's still sitting there, OK? So I'm looking at a cross section of this cone. And I'm going to cut off the left-hand side just to look at the right-hand side. And what is that? Big triangle, small triangle. You see this again? We've got similar triangles. Now, can you tell me the distance from here to here? Three, Three because it's half of this cone. Can you tell me the distance from here down to here? Four. Four. OK. What is the distance from here down to here? For us, what are we calling that? H. And then what is the distance? from here to here. Isn't that the radius of our cone? Yep. R. Right? Now, I have, I have similar triangles. Let me, let me draw them over here. I have one big triangle that looks like this, three, four. And I have a smaller triangle that looks like this, where this is H and R. Right? And because these are similar triangles, I can set up a ratio. If I set up the ratio, I could do it this way. I could do r over 3 equals h over 4. Why, why am I doing this? 
Why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? I'm going to be able to solve this for r in terms of h, right? r will be equal to 3 fourths h, multiplying both sides by 3. If r is 3 fourths h, I can now take that and replace it right here, and now my equation has nothing but v and h in it. I've eliminated r. Do you all see that? I've eliminated r from the equation. So using, this is, the volume, this is the volume of any cone. But see, because our cone has, because our water is shaped like a cone, but that, that water lives in a bigger cone, the, the proportions of our cone are fixed. So the proportion of our, the cone that's growing in here is fixed also. And the relationship is that the radius will always be 3 fourths the height. Within this picture, that's what happens. So I can now go back to my volume formula, because remember, I want an equation here. And my equation that I'm going to use is v equals 1 third pi. But what's r for us? 3 fourths, 3 fourths h squared times h again. So there you go. 1 third pi r squared h. Let's go ahead and square that. Do y'all need to take a deep breath? Are y'all okay? What's going on? Keep going. Can I erase this side, this side over here? You got it? Let's clean up this volume equation. Volume equals 1 third pi. What's, what is r squared? 9 sixteenths, right? H squared, but then times H again. H cubed. So the volume is three sixteenths pi H cubed. There's our equation. That's the one we're going to differentiate. Right? What? You see why I like it? Why? Oh, you see why? Yeah, I didn't say I liked it. I liked it. Well, I, I can't say that. Never mind. I used, I used to present this problem. All right, I keep going. If we ever have a problem where we have more variables than we have information about, right? Because there are certain problems that you could have three variables, but you have all the information you need. This particular one, we know, we know a little bit about how V is changing. We want to know how H is changing. We know nothing about how R is changing. The only thing that saves us is the fact, again, that this water must live in a cone that has fixed dimensions. So that, that volume has to grow in a certain way. The relationship with the, between the radius and height are always fixed. All right, derivative time. What is the derivative of the left side? dv dt equals derivative of the right hand side. 3 16 pi is a constant, right? That's going to come for the ride. What is the derivative of h cubed with respect to time? 3 h squared times dh dt. There's your chain rule, right? That dh dt pops out. And I'm very pleased to see this because that's what I'm solving for. Do we know dv dt? Yes. Do we know h at the moment in time? Yes, three. I've got everything I need. Okay? So now we plug in. This is two pi. 
equals, this is 3 16 pi times 3 times h was 3 again, squared times dh dt. Kill the pies. Divide both sides by pi. Uh, what next? 3 times 3 times 3 times 3, right? 81. This is 81 over 16. The pi is gone. We're almost there. Just multiply both sides by the reciprocal. Multiply both sides by 16 over 81. And we will have arrived at the answer. So dh dt is equal to 32 over 81 what? Inches, heights measured in inches, so inches per second. And not cubed because height is a measurement of a distance, right? Not of a volume. So we were looking for dv, then they would be. If we were looking for dv dt, then we would, we'd be in business, yeah. So this is roughly like, I don't know, a third of an inch or so, not quite. A third of an inch a second is how fast it's coming up the, the cup. So let's say you kind of knew the general shape of like a, a lake and you have a dam and you have a flood and you have water coming up, right? You could actually measure the flow going into the lake, like from the rivers. You could approximate the volume going into the, into the lake and then you'd be t asking yourself, like how fast is it coming up the wall? So like they give you DVDT water coming in, and then you try and say, okay, well, how, how long do we have? It's a little more complicated with the lake because usually you're draining water out. So you have water coming in, you're draining water out, but still, if water's coming in faster and it's going out, then you can start to say, how fast is the, the lake level rising? Is it gonna go over the dam? So when you hear these things on the news about, you know, they say the dam is going to breach, you know, that the water is gonna go over, it's because they've done the calculations. They know how fast it's coming up, it's coming, it's going over, right? All right. Um, are y'all tired of this yet? I think we have one more problem. Actually, two. For what? Well, it depends on the shape of the pool. You would have to have some sort of volume equation for the, the, the container. So with the lake, it would be hard, but you know, the, better your, the better your data is, you could, get a good, you could get a volume function if they've measured out like depths in certain areas and, you know. Does that make sense? Yeah. What's most important is what's happening on the edges, like how, how fast the ground is coming up at the edges of the lake. That would be the most important. Like what's happening down way deep doesn't matter because it's already filled to a certain point. So you just need to know maybe those top 10 or 20 feet what the general shape is. And it would be a an approximation. It wouldn't be perfect. A runner. This is kind of a creepy problem. A runner sprints around a circular track which has a radius of 50 meters. She runs at a constant rate of seven meters per second. I say her friend, but it's more of like a stalker, okay? Is standing at a point 100 meters from the center of the track, watching her. How fast is the distance between the two changing when, they, when the two are exactly 120 meters apart? All right. 
Got a girl running around a circular track. Okay, running around a circular track. She's got a friend who's watching her, taking pictures without her knowing. It's her coach. Does it say that? Doesn't say that. Sorry, it could be anybody at this point. It says friend, but that's, that's debatable. Okay, so she's running. She's got someone watching her. And uh, want to know how fast the distance between the two is changing at an exact moment that they're 120 meters apart. So I think I just need to start getting a picture up here. I'm going to start with the circular track. Anything we know about this circular track other than it's a circle? It has a radius of 50 meters, right? So the radius of this track is 50 meters. That should not change throughout the problem, right? Pardon? If your friend is standing in the center and it's 100 meters, wouldn't it be 100? No, no. Her friend's standing at a point 100 meters from the center of the track. She's running around a, 50, uh, a, a track that's a circle with 50 meters. That's why I think it's a stalker. Because the, the person is not actually standing near the track. It's 50 meters away from the edge of the track in the bushes. Right? You can visualize it more if you start to put a story to it. All right, so this is our circular track, right? And we have a runner on that track somewhere. And we're not saying which direction they're running, but they're one or the other. So let's just, let's just go counterclockwise. I'll just do it that way. I mean, it could go the other way. But here's my runner, and my runner has the little lines on it behind it like that. That's for Jace. And running in that direction around the track like this at a certain speed, right? Seven meters a second. I'm just going to put that here. Seven meters a second, just to kind of give us a visual of what's happening. This is my general picture. I forgot to label this. This is my general picture. And where is her friend? At any point, 100 meters from the center of the track. I can put that anywhere, can't I? So if this is 50 meters, I could put it another 50 meters. Her friend could be standing here, right? Or I could go out 50 this way and then go another 50. It could be here, right? So I'm just, to make it easy, I'm just going to go straight out this way. So I'm going to go straight out this way like this. That's 50 meters. I go another 50 meters. There's her friend right there watching her. What I do know is that this distance from here to here is what? 100. 100. That's not changing, right? That's 100 meters. Let's get the instant in time picture up here. It's the same picture, isn't it? Except when this person's here, how far away are they supposed to be? 120 meters, I'm going to put her like around here. That distance right here is 120 meters, right? That's the instant in time. Now, isn't there another place where she's 120 meters? How about down here, right? So there's two spots, but I'm only going to look at one. In one of them, she's actually moving away from the stalker. In the other one, she's moving towards the stalker, right? Okay, so that's my instant in time. Can you tell me what I want or what I'm given? Is what I what? dr over dt is is what the out of all that what do you mean uh, which one of those things up there is dr dt r r is 
R is 50, but it's fixed, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Isn't the radius of track fixed? That's never changing, right? So we do, we do not want to assign a variable to this because it's always 50. No matter where she is on the track, that's 50, right? It might be easier to, for us to start with what we want. What, what do we want? How fast is the distance between the two? So where is that in our general picture, the distance between the two? Well, we haven't drawn it, have we? We haven't drawn it. So why don't we draw it? The distance between the two is this straight line distance, right? And we be better label it something. I don't know. B? You said B? That's what I heard is B. I, I like to stay away. I like to stay away from. Okay, back on the record. So, B, right, B is the distance between the two. And we are interested in the rate at which B is changing, right? So, D, B, D, T. And when do we want this? When what's 120? B. B. All right, when B is 120. So we had to come in here and put the B here, right? We had to come up with that ourselves. <clears throat> the given is the hardest part of this problem. Well, the first hardest part of the problem is finding out what's given. You, you know that this person is running at a certain speed, right? Like she's, she's running at a certain speed, and the, the speed she's running is a derivative, isn't it? It's a derivative. It's d something dt. But 7 meters per second is a straight line distance, right? And I can't, like, it's not a variable on my picture. Do you all, do you all understand that? Like, you can't say b is changing at 7 feet per second because she's running in a circle. She's not running in a straight line. Hmm. So I think, I think this is where I just need to kind of show you. That way you will have said, you say to yourself, I've seen, this pro I've seen a problem like this before. Now I know I can do this. I'm going to draw this very important line right here. Now we all know that's 50, right? Because it's a radius line. And I'm going to label this angle as theta. Now here's why that's important. I know how fast theta is changing. I know d theta dt. I don't know it right away, but I'm going to be able to find it. Because what they're giving you here, 7 meters per second, is her linear speed around the track. We can take linear speed and find angular speed, and that's a precal. It's like, it has to do with arcs and omega. Remember all? No, no, it's been forever. But, okay. But instead of trying to go back to formulas and precal, let's just try and think through this. Can you tell me how long it takes her to run around this track one time? Yes. How? Okay, so you first are finding the circumference. Okay, so the circumference of the track, we'll get back to the given in a second. The circumference of the track is 2 pi times 50, which is uh, 100 pi feet. Agreed? That is the circumference of the track. So it's like if you were to cut the track and lay it out in a straight line, it would be 100 pi feet long, right? Now how fast is she running? seven meters per second. The track is a hundred pi, I said feet? Yeah, sorry, this is supposed to be meters. Yeah, it's supposed to be meters, sorry, because meters in here. Hundred pi meters long is the track if you lay it out straight. She runs seven meters every second, right? How many seconds is it going to take her to do this? How many seconds to go around the track one time? So you just do what? Divide that by 7, right? So 100 pi divided by 7 
right? This is meters. Seven meters per second. If I divide that, what do you get? Give me approximate, or. 25 almost. What do you get? 25 seconds. 45? 45. 45, is that what you said, 45? Oh, I was thinking five. Oh, no, let's get the decimal. Let's just do the decimal. 44.85. About 44.85. We'll go 48.9 48 seconds is how long it would take her to go around the track. Are you following me? Now, I would like to know what her, what her angular speed is. So if she goes around the track, right, if she goes around the track one time in 48.9 seconds, then she goes through an entire rotation in that much time. An entire rotation is 2 pi. So if I take 2 pi and divide it by 48.9, that will tell me her angular speed in radians per second. See, this is 2 pi radians over this many seconds. So someone do that on their calculator. Take 2 pi and divide it by 48.9. We're going to get approximately something. <clears throat> okay, 0 0.12 radians per second. Is that correct? That's what you got? Okay. So let's, let's try and recap. This is a tough problem. You've got this girl running around the track. You've got her coach. Okay, her coach is watching her. Doesn't make him not creepy, but he's watching her. And she's going around the track. We're trying to figure out the rate at which the distance between them is changing. All we're told is how fast she's running around the track. That doesn't help us because we can't label another variable here. There's no more straight lines. This is 100, that's 50. There's no changing that, right? So in order to get away with, or to, to work this out, what we do is we convert her, her linear speed around the track to an angular speed. There's her angular speed. She is running around this track so that she is going 0.12 radians a second. 0.12 radians a second around the track. Make sense? Now, if I do this, now all I need to do is connect theta to b. And go to your general picture and take a look at what you have there. Do you all, do you all see this over here? Theta and b. Do you all see this picture? Theta, 100, 50, and B. And that is not a right triangle. Can you think of an equation that relates those? Hmm? Sec uh, this is not arced. This, is, this doesn't have an arc on it. Right, this is straight line, straight line, straight line. But you're in the right class, pre-cal. <clears throat> uh, I forgot the law. Law of? Law of sines. Yeah. Sines is when you have cosines. two angles and two sides. Law of cosines is when you have one angle and two sides. So at this point, I'll remind you, I'll remind you of this. If this is angle A, B, C, little a, little c, little b, law of cosines says uh, little a squared equals um, b squared plus c squared minus 2bc cosine of capital A. That's law of cosines. Now, there's, three, uh, there's two other versions of it. You could have this for b squared equals a squared plus c squared minus 2ac, blah, blah, blah. But this is just, once you have one, you can create the others. Does that look familiar from pre-cal? Okay, so for our picture, for our picture, a is the theta, okay? c is 50, b is 100, right? And A is B, that's stupid. But that's, that's how it corresponds to our picture. Yes or no? 
Okay, I have to erase this because I'm running out of room. Here we go. What do I write next? I'm using this formula, but the A is really what for us? B, no, no, this, this A right here for us is actually B on my triangle. Oh, yeah, but right? is it 120? Not yet. Be careful. We haven't differentiated. Oh, okay. Right? We will differentiate, and then it'll be 120. Okay, so right now I have B squared equals, okay, B times C, or B squared, sorry, plus C squared. What the hell? B squared plus C squared is what I meant to say. That's this squared plus this squared, which means this squared plus this squared. So 100 squared plus 50 squared minus 2 times 100 times 50. Y'all okay with that? And then cosine of theta. And check out that equation. What are the only two variables in it? B and theta. So when you differentiate that with respect to time, you're going to get a db dt, which is what we're looking for, and you're going to get a d theta dt, which we have. Let's clean it up, though. Okay, 100 squared is, I mean, yeah, 100 squared is 10,000. 50 squared is 2500, right? 2500, and you add that to 10,000, so what are we at? 1250? 1250? 1,500? Like that? 12,500? And then here, minus negative 10,000. And then cosine theta. And no, you may not put those together, right? Multiplication comes before that. Okay, that's, a, I think, a pretty clean equation, right? That's the one I'm going to differentiate. Here's the derivative. 2b db dt, right, equals derivative of this, 0, minus 10,000. Oh, but that minus 10,000 is actually going to become plus 10,000, right? Because derivative cosine is negative sine. So it's going to become 10,000 sine theta d theta dt. Chain rule, right? Derivative cosine of something is negative sine, but then derivative of the inside is d theta dt. And now... Now we're here. This is it. We check it. Um, d theta dt, we know that, don't we? I also know what b is. b is 120. Now you can fix it. Now you can. Do I know db dt? I don't know that, but that's what I want, right? So I'm okay seeing that. The only thing I really need to know is what? I need to know what theta is, and, and that means I need to know what sine theta is. And unfortunately, unfortunately, um, this is not a right triangle, so I can't use the Pythagorean to get sine. You actually have to solve this for theta. You're going to have to go get theta. Now, how do you get it? Is it 120? Yeah. This equation right here. Yeah. Put 120 right here. Subtract that, divide by that arc cosine both sides. That'll give you theta. Yeah? We're going to finish this problem, okay? I feel like we're, we're intimately connected to it at this point. It wouldn't make sense just to say dot, 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 finish it yourself. We're going all the way with it, all right? So at this point, we need, we need theta. So to get theta, we replace that with 120. 120 squared is 144... Zero, 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 no. Yeah. Two zeros, not three, yeah. One, four, four, zero, zero equals uh, 12,500 minus 10,000 cosine theta. Uh, subtract 12,5 from both sides.
1900, then divide that by 10,000, or negative 10,000, right? I think I'm getting negative 0 0.19 equals cosine theta. Anyone else get that? Anyone else? No? no? Yes? Now, arc cosine both sides. And <clears throat> this, uh, this depends right now what mode you're in in the calculator. So I don't even know what mode I'm in. Who has that for me? Just, just as long as you tell me what your answer is in. I don't care if it's radians or degrees. Anyone? Anyone? 1 1.76 radians. 1 radians. Anyone else get that? Were you in radians also? OK. So we get 1.76 radians is theta. So now we know what theta is, right? Let's plug everything in now, and we'll be able to solve for dBdt. All right? So we have 2. What's B? 120 equals 10,000 sine of 1.76, which we'll do on our calculator, and we'll do it in radian mode, since this is radians. And then d theta dt. What was d theta dt? It was 0 0.12. Oh, what am I forgetting my dBdt? Sorry, this one right here, right? Was right here next to 120. That's the second time I've done that today. That's weird because I don't ever do that. It's strange. Still thinking about how pathetic our society is right now. I tell you, man. Everyone's so sensitive. I'm going to lose my job one day because I record my freaking lectures. That's, it's going to happen. I'm, I'm always so like, I have to just, but I turn off the camera, man. Woo. My camera didn't work yesterday in my college algebra class, man. We were talking about all sorts of stuff. It was crazy. <laughs> all right. The right side is going to equal 1,178. Okay, good. I was hoping someone had that. Oh, five nine. Okay. And then here we've got two forty. DBDT. So divide through, and we should have it. Four point nine. Is that right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Four point nine. Something. One. Approximately. What, what, what over what? B was a measurement from the coat, the stalker, okay, to the, to, let's just say what it is, okay, to the person that's in meters, meters, not feet. And then time was in seconds. What would you, what would you think, what would you be thinking to yourself if you got this answer, and let's say it was like 12.4? What would you be thinking? It's wrong. Why? It's too fast. There's no way that she can ever be running, the distance between them can ever be greater than her speed, which is 7 feet per second, right? It's 7 meters per second. So 4.91 meters per second makes sense. Part of her speed is moving away from him, but part of her speed is around, you know, it's, it's curving. So that makes, I think that makes the most sense. Do you all agree with this? For that answer, would you put plus or minus 4.91? You could put plus or minus because it would depend on if she's going towards or, you know, away. Yeah, I'm not going to take off. I mean, if you, get, if you get through all the rest of the problem and, you know, forget plus or minus, I'm not going to be like, <laughs> no, no. But it's good. It is correct to think of it both ways. Hey, out of curiosity, what if the question was asking, 
how fast the distance between the two was changing when they were 150 meters apart. It's impossible. Mm, 150 is, would work. I mean, it's going to be a whole different stuff. Where would she be? He's 100, right? So where's she? Over here? What should the answer be? How fast, at that instant that she's on the other side of the track, at that instant, the rate at which she's going away from him should be zero. Do you think it would be? Where's our formula? It was 2b db dt equals one, I, I'm going off of memory here. Is this right? I don't think that's right. Minus, shit. Cosine theta? No, I've totally jacked this up. That's way off. One less zero on this. This was, I'm looking at the derivative after I did implicit. This would have been plus. After the implicit. Oh, there's no constant. Come on, help me out. Oh, 12. Yeah, you know what? I think, is it right? Oh, it's right there. Right? What about the part? Two times B, D, B, D, T. And then was that 10,000? Okay, 10,000. And then sine, now we have to go get what theta is. And then this was 0 0.12. Right, we'd have to get what theta is. But what is theta? You can, you can actually tell me just by looking at this what theta is. It's 180 degrees, so pi or whatever. What is sine of pi? What's sine of 180? Nope, that's cosine. Zero. Right? Zero. And so when you put pi here, 180, that's when she's on the other side. This becomes zero, right? And then B is 150, so this becomes 300 dB dt equals zero. So divide by 300, you get dB dt is zero. So the rate at which she's going away from him is zero when she is on the opposite side of the track, which makes perfect sense. I don't know. That blows my mind. That always blows my mind. I mean, I, I don't think I've ever done that example. I've never actually talked about that before. But it's, it's just amazing that the mathematics works for, that, for every situation around that circle. It works. Where would she actually be going the fastest towards him? When would the distance between them be increasing or decreasing the fastest? Yeah, but where would it be on the track is what I'm asking. Could, could it, would it ever be seven meters per second? And if so, where would it be? That's a tough problem. It would actually, you would have to run a line to where it hits tangent right there. That tangent line, she would basically be going in the direction directly towards him. That's a hard question. I'm going to mess with that later. That seems like fun. I think it would be seven. I'm going to say think because I don't, I'm pretty sure it would be because this would be a right triangle. And so she would be, she would be moving tangential to that. So all of her forward speed would be directed towards him. So it should be the full seven. Interesting problem. All right, I think we're... Yeah, so that's, that's the picture. I wrote the code for it, so I may as well play it. That's her running around the track. All right, time for you to try one. You have nine minutes, which isn't much time at all. Let's at least get it set up. This will be a take-home quiz. I'm going to change some stuff in here because I probably have a video out there that already has this solution. So let me change a few things on this. A, let's go with a 30-foot ladder. It's a huge ladder. It's moving. It's sliding down at 
2.5 feet per second at the moment. The ladder is 12 feet from the ground. How fast is the ladder moving away from the wall? Okay, I'll let you write it down in a second. Let me show you what's happening, though. You have a ladder that's sliding down a wall. So the best way I can really explain this is you've got this, you've got this ladder. You now see this up against a wall like that? And what's happening is that it's, it's lost its grip, so it's starting to slide out like this. Okay? Sliding out. So a 30-foot ladder slides down a wall such that the top of the ladder is moving downward at a constant rate of one foot per second. So that corner is moving down one foot per second. At the moment, the top of the ladder is 12 feet. You know what? Let's make that not 12. Let's make that... Let's make that three feet from the ground. How fast is the bottom of the ladder moving away from the wall? So here's your picture. That's slowed down. You get the idea. So as this slides, as this slides, like this, we, we're, this is coming down at a constant rate, and we want to know at a certain instant how fast that lat point of the ladder is moving away. All right? This is not like the runner around the track problem. This is this is more basic problem. All right? So let's see how you do with that. I'll put the problem back up here. Let's say that's due at the beginning of class on Tuesday. I would prefer that you work alone, but if you want to work together, that's fine. Um, I was talking to one of your classmates earlier about trying to study and finding a way. You know, when I was, when I was in school, one of the things that I used to do is <clears throat> there was a couple of us, like three or four of us, that we would we'd, we'd each do the homework on our own, and then we would meet together and we would talk about the homework, and we would try and explain to each other how we did the problems. Or if we got stuck on something, we would hope that someone else in the group had figured it out. Or sometimes we would take the, the homework and we would, we would do what we call divide and conquer. So like one of us would take you know, every, every fifth problem and the other person would take every you know, one before that. So like maybe I would do number one, five, 10, and 15. Someone else would do two, six, and 16. Does that make sense? And then what we would do is we'd meet together and any problems that I did, so maybe I did the four problems, I would, I would teach that to my friends. And then they would teach what they did. And just that whole interaction and teaching and helping each other out really helps put it in here. I'm just giving you some ideas. I can't force you to make groups together. I can't force you to work outside of class. Mm -hmm. But if you're trying to find a way to improve your grade and do better, that's just some suggestions, things that worked for me. All right, you think you can handle that? Don't go to the tutoring lab and just be like, I need help on this, because you'll get, the, you'll get 100, but you need to be able to do this, right? You need to be able to understand it. So, you know, this is more about you just learning. All right, we're, we're ending early. How about that?